Hello, welcome to Café Rollist. Uh, I'm here today with the author, I actually don't remember neither well enough to remember the name, Arlan Corbin? No, that's a real novelist. Who are you? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm Craig Campbell, um, and I'm the owner and lead designer at Nerdburger Games, um, and I make role-playing games and uh, do podcasts and streams and things like this, and um, and I'm uh, doing a little online convention in a month or so. So um, we got in touch over Twitter um, and talked briefly. Uh, it, it's possible that you will be bringing some uh, some events to the convention. Yeah, you yeah. Work it would be there, uh, I hope. it would be a nice little warm up to Virtually Expo, which is the the replacement for the big convention here, UK Games Expo, which is not happening. Uh, so like Gen Con, like Origins, or uh, like how Origins was supposed to, we're having a, a virtual version, and uh, and I'm having right. a tour of all the online convention to uh, to make demonstrations of my uh, my game Paris Gondo, the life saving inventoring of magic. So, but tell me what is? Oh no, wait. First, let's use our. Uh, we were just talking about uh, all the joyous things happening in the world right now. Uh, this spin-off of my main show started with the lockdown and I've got a couple of ice-breaking questions. The first one is, uh, what's your routine like at the moment? Um, well, I'm in the States and I'm in the South. Um, so if you know anything about how the United States kind of breaks down, the South is heavily conservative and it's heavily uh, kind of in support of um, certain people in the administration right now. And uh, governors lean um, toward uh, kind of following guidelines there. So, yeah, we uh, we we everything uh, got locked down for a few weeks a while back, and then we opened everything back up. And I'm sure that you know, like in the world news, you're seeing that oh, the United States is having these huge spikes in COVID-19 cases, um, in particular certain states, and a lot of those states are ones that locked down and then opened up too quickly. Um, the problem, the the situation, my my situation personally is I was working from home for a while. Um, I'm back working in the office now. I am lucky um, in that um, I work in an office. It's a very small office. There's only a handful of us, and we're all very spread out. Um, and so, I, and I live alone. Um, so my my <laughs> I am kind of naturally socially distanced, um, just by the circumstances of my uh, my home and what my workspace is normally like. Um, but so outside of that, otherwise I'm not, you know, I'm not going out and about too much. I'm, I'm online a lot with, uh, as far as social interaction, things like this. So yeah, that's I, where I'm at. I s just figuring that this is probably going to be the case for a while. Yes. It feels like that. We were having, uh, actually so for the first time people I knew in fifth month, uh, last weekend, they came over for my birthday. We were supposed to go in the park, so we would be distancing each other and then the weather was terrible and yeah we managed we kept all masks on and so on but uh yeah different people have different views on that uh my my father sent me a beautiful birthday wishes video where they were all with a group of friends together uh, shoulder to shoulder to sing me happy birthday and i was like no <laughs> stay apart no. from each other <laughs> But yeah, he would not have appreci appreciated me uh, commenting uh, upon that. Uh, so yeah, we here we've been in a bubble for for five months. My wife is working from home. I'm unemployed. Uh, my son just resumed nursery. And they got a whole bunch of measures at the nursery. You, I bring my son. They change his clothes. Uh, it's um, it's quite impressive. They kept in bubbles of four children. So yeah, we're quite lucky that they they managed to to pull that off. Uh, have you picked up any new hobbies, skills, or interests lately? <laughs> um, well, I mean the 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 uh, like the the lack of social going out and doing things, um, and you know not going to game conventions and stuff like that has allowed me to spend more time <laughs> in uh, my. RPG design stuff, which is just kind of a side gig. I mean, I, ha I have a day job um, and I do this uh, and I design games on the side. And so I've, I've kind of thrown myself into that quite a bit. Um, and with the lack of um, conventions that are available, um, 
and just you know just online stuff that's pretty much all that's happening now i decided to uh originally i thought well i'll just do like a game day i'll just get like some of the fans of my stuff and maybe some friends and stuff and we'll just get some people together on saturday and play a bunch of games um and i decided to take a stab at trying to make it into um an actual like little you know it's it's not going to be terribly large um kind of online convention and i i sound like you know i've brought this up twice and i sound like i'm shilling and i am a little bit um but that's like that that's the hobby that came up it's like i'm suddenly like you know I'm, I'm not going out so what can i do that's you know more or less online given that uh um uh you know given my involvement in the rpg community so so that's the very first edition of nerd burger con then yeah and it, it may it may be the only one we'll see how it works out <laughs> i'm just hoping that it I, just th I thought i'd give it a shot you know i figured i've got the time available to plan for it i know that there are people out there who would appreciate Uh, an outlet to uh, to try out some new games and to maybe meet some people and kind of build uh, the online community a little more. Um, so I figured I'd give it a shot and see what happens. Well, you got a nice uh, roster of people. I noticed that uh, a few names. I know <coughs> I'm not not much of a streaming consumer, but I saw you had the little red dot, uh, the broadsword, I think, and somebody else I knew. Daniel Kwan. Unfortunately, I asked the broadswords. Um, unfortunately, they are really tied up with all sorts of other things. Um, but uh, yeah, and it, admittedly, the uh, the roster of guests for streamers and designers um, skews a bit toward um, American folks. But uh, I, I pulled a handful of um, people from around uh, the around the world outside of the U.S. as well. But um, um, and a lot of them are like people that I've gotten to know. Um, over the past couple of years and you know some of them like with the streamers some of them have run some of my stuff or had just otherwise been very supportive um, and then among the um, the RPG designers um, there's uh, uh, some of them are just friends that I've known that I've made in the industry and then other people others are recommendations from friends that I've made in the industry and I said okay I want to try to have like a nice broad diverse group I want to you know uh, uh, show off some design Um, voices that don't necessarily get um, a lot of uh, uh, publicity and, and, you know, like just s people that are working, you know, by themselves, that they're just doing their thing. They don't have a marketing budget or a marketer or anything like that. It's just a chance to, um, to bring a bunch of different types of games together and say, like, I'd, I'd like to see if I have, like, let's say if I had 50 events, I'd like it to be like 25 different games. Um, so that it's not like a you know a, a convention that focuses on just two or three game systems, but it, you know it's an opportunity to go in and try out like oh I, I've never heard of this let me this sounds interesting let me try that or here's a thing that I've I've heard about but I've never had the chance to play and now I can finally play it. So is it what's going to happen? Are there panels? Are there streams? Uh, what shape is it taking? What what are all these great people uh, who are coming uh, going to do? I expect it to be heavy on games. There'll be a lot of game sessions of like two hours, four hour um, game events. Um, people have asked to do streams. There's already some people that have submitted some ideas for streams. Um, <clears throat> there'll be uh, or, uh, stream stuff. Um, there'll be panels. Um, people have submitted some ideas for panels. Um, as far as the streams go, I'm kind of leaving that with the streamers to decide what they want to do. Like if they have a favorite game that they want to try to, you know, they'll, they'll advertise it as a game event. People can sign up for it, no, go, go into it knowing that it's going to be streamed um, so that, uh, you know, there are no surprises. We don't want somebody who, you know, is uh, a little shy or doesn't want to have their face out on the Internet <laughs> to sign up for those events. There will be plenty of other events that they can play. Um, and then the hope, too, is, is to have um, on the Discord um, to have um, a variety of um, support and um Uh, social spaces like there'll be um, chat room uh, uh, like voice chat and text chat rooms where you know you can just come get together and talk about geeky stuff or games or whatever um, and there'll be um, a channel that's just for um, organizing impromptu games so like if somebody comes in and says well hey I didn't get a chance to submit an event but I'd really love to run this game are there any players that want to sit down let's let's play this I'm ready to go right now or you know can we get together in an hour and play um, So it's uh, it's a shotgun approach. Like I'm trying a whole bunch of different things, and we'll hope hopefully uh, 
um, it'll be a little bit of something for everybody. So that's August 14th, 15th. What are the dates again? Um, August 14, 15, and 16. Um, and it's going to be the, the the times are based out of the U.S. Um, but I tried to make sure that we're um, that on Saturday and Sunday that the the hours that we're running are long enough that it will at least coincide a little bit. Okay, like people in Europe or um, out in the Pacific uh, Pacific, you know, the the uh, like Southeast Asia and so forth, will be able to you know sneak in a game at like the beginning or the end <laughs> that where where it coincides well with their timing. Um, so yeah, fr Friday, it'll just be like 6 p.m. Eastern into the evening. And then Saturday, it'll be like from 10 o'clock in the morning all the way through to, to midnight. And then Sunday will be 10 in the morning until 6 p.m. So that those people who have uh, nine to five jobs on Monday can be wrapped up and uh, spend some time with their families maybe on Sunday evening um, before they have to go back to work. Um, and then the, the events themselves will be spread out over all of those. I, I plan to have uh, events starting um, on every even hour and I'll be spreading them all out. So like any given even hour that will be, you know, two, three, four, five events, depending on uh, what people's availability and, and their preferences for when they can run and host events. Are you, are you going to run stuff yourself or are you going to be running uh, left and right to make sure everybody's <laughs> having fun? Uh, because I organize a few things and uh, often it is the second more of the former. Yeah, I've, um, I've, I've gotten a number of volunteers to help and who have offered up, including some people who are willing to be kind of help desk um, on Saturday and Sunday. So they're going to be available during uh, big chunks of the day to uh, answer questions and make sure everything runs smoothly. So I, I hope to run a couple of my games. Um, probably Friday night, I'll just manage it and make sure everything runs smoothly to kick off. And then sat I'll, I'll schedule myself to run something on Saturday and to run something on Sunday. And then I'll have um, volunteers that'll kind of help cover those times when I'm not available. But I, I also hope to, you know, just be in the chat rooms and um, maybe play in a game <laughs> too, where I'll just like, if I, if I play a game, I'll make sure to let the GM know like, Hey, I'm the organizer here. I might have to pop out to handle something, um, which is easier to do if I'm playing um, than if I'm running anything. So if whatever I run will probably be shorter games, I'll probably just run like two hour games just so that I'm not away from things for too long. Um, but some of my some of the games that I've designed will get run by um, some of uh, other people that are that are fans of the games. Cool. Uh, and it's I, not there. There will be there will be some of my games, but it won't be like all my games. The idea again is to bring um, a lot of other people. So so it's not Nerd Burger Con. You can come and participate, and but you all have to run Craig's games. That's all. That's all which is uh, <laughs> available. Well, nothing. Nothing but capers all day, like 70 slots of one game. No, no. Um, I expect there'll be, you know, four, five, six slots of, of my stuff, and then it'll be all everybody else. Cool. So what? In, 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 and I'm, hope, I'm hoping to see 30 or 40 slots at least. Well, I fancy myself uh, the title of the least knowledgeable podcasters of the hobby. So t <laughs> tell me about your game, tell me, or game or games, uh, if you have several. So... What do you have on offer? Um, well, uh, the the probably the flagship game is called Capers. Um, that's the the big one. It, I uh, did a, um, a a core book for that and three supplements. The third one is almost done. Is it about um, cooking a good puttanesca sauce for pasta? <laughs> Not that kind of caper. Um, capers, uh, well, the, the, the term capers actually has a few different meanings in the game, but basically it's, um, it's super powered gangsters during the roaring twenties. So it's a little American centric, but if, uh, even if you're not from the U S, um, and don't necessarily know much about history, the game kind of gives you the background of that era in the U S. Um, and if you've seen gangster movies and, uh, or if you've seen uh, boardwalk empire from HBO or any of that kind of stuff, you, you know, you have a sense, a lot of people have a sense of what the. It's kind of the the like. spirit also, I guess. Uh. Yeah, it's the idea is that you're playing the the game is set in 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 the Roaring Twenties in the 1920s in the U.S. when alcohol was effectively illegal. Um, prohibition was in place for 13 years and made pretty much everything about alcohol illegal. 
Um, and that, of course, caused um, the organized crime industry within the U.S. to uh, explode. Um, there was organized crime before prohibition. Organized crime became what we know it to be in the U.S. because of prohibition, because it was so lucrative. Um, and so you're playing gangster characters living in that kind of, in sort of a romanticized version of that world, because in real life, those people were murderous thugs. They were terrible people um, for the most part. And so it, it, this is kind of playing the movie version of that, um, where you're looking to build your empire or take out rivals or um, and you can potentially play, you know, law enforcement as well. But in that era, law enforcement was heavily underfunded, undermanned, like they, they, they couldn't keep up with uh, the, uh, the criminal element that that came out of prohibition. They weren't prepared for it at all. So it's kind of a losing battle. So what does it look like in terms of, of system? Uh, what, what's the focus of it? Uh, I developed my own uh, mechanics for the game, and it uses um, playing cards rather than dice. So every player, in, in the GM included, each of you has your own deck of playing cards, um, kind of your standard poker-style deck uh, with two jokers in it. Um, and it's a uh, essentially a, a, like a press-your-luck system where you will have, based on your character stats, you'll be able to flip one or more cards. Um, and you flip one card at a time and determine whether you're going to stick with that card or risk and go for a better card. Um, and the pip value of the card determines success versus failure. The suit of the card determines the degree of success or failure. So you could flip a very high card that has a low degree of success, like an, like the king of clubs. The king is probably very good, but clubs is the worst suit, so you're barely successful. So do you want to try to get something that's better, more successful? Um, so you can flip another card and you risk um, failing in getting a card that won't succeed at all. So um, each each trait check that you make is like sort of its own little gambling press your luck game. So was that a, a, a constru well I assume you, you, you picked a system using cards uh, because you, you liked the, the concept of it or was it uh, also to be in tune with the game, the 1920s gangsters, they're often playing cards at the back or uh, in the speakeasy and this sort of things. Huh? It ended up kind of being a little bit of both. It was initially it was a personal challenge to just try to do something with playing cards because um, I knew I, I, I've played plenty of games with dice. I know a lot of different dice systems. Um, I had been a big fan of the Deadlands game the original deadlines game which uses playing cards to or for part of the mechanics and i thought well what about doing a game that was you know utilized playing cards for the whole mechanical system um and so it's kind of a challenge and then as i got going i realized well this is also you know thematically perfect for the 20s with uh with illegal gambling dens and so forth and so you're playing a you're playing a card game um to determine success and failure for your character Uh, and there were all sorts of little interesting things that come out of um, working with decks of cards because the, the composition of the deck is always changing. So the history of the deck kind of becomes a thing. Like as you play, you might be flipping a lot of low cards. So now you know you've got a lot of high cards left in the deck. So you might be a little, you might take more risks because you know that. Um, and, uh, and I also did not expect this, but I noticed very early that playing the game at the table becomes a lot like playing craps or black well not blackjack but craps um i apologize everybody the train is going by <laughs> um but it's a lot like uh at the craps table where everybody kind of bets with or against the shooter and so at the table you're playing characters that are cooperating with each other so you're kind of cheering for um the other players to to flip good cards so like you get a lot of people that really get into watching what other people's decks are doing and like you know if they're going to flip the somebody's like not sure if they're going to flip another card and somebody next to him is saying go go flip 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 you've got lots of face cards left in the deck go 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 um so there's uh there's an engagement at the table that uh, tends to come out that was unexpected but is really fun so you were saying that the the team of the the game was there before the system somewhat uh What was that team at first and what did it develop into? Was it something, okay, the, that, is it a concept and it's to the, the players and the game master to seize it? Or is it, do you have a somewhat exhaustive setting which you developed behind it? 
Um, I, I developed a, a pretty comprehensive setting. Um, now, certainly you can build up uh, your own setting in different cities, um, but like in the game, in the book, um, I, I described New York, Chicago, and Atlantic City in quite a bit of depth. Um, and then uh, there's like one page write ups on a bunch of other cities that are just like enough information for your characters to go to that city or at least to give you a starting point if you wanted to like I want to run a game that's in Miami and and have uh, you know imports coming in from Cuba um, and bringing liquor in from the from the from the Caribbean islands. Um, and so uh, the, the setting is is fairly well developed, but it's not so deeply developed that you can't just build something of your own so, um, and then there's a lot of gm tools in the book that are um that are just generic like here's a whole bunch of just generic npcs type type you know, basic types of npcs that you can plug into any city that you're playing in or any city that you're creating so what you liked with the that topic was i mean what do you like do you did you like the the concept and uh run away with it or are you especially interested in the the actual history of things or things uh, unraveled over the years and uh, how much stuff from actual history did did you put in your game? Was it one of the goal of the your game to uh, maybe to inform people a bit uh, about what was going on uh, about sometimes interesting uh, bits of history that uh, we we missing out? I, I'm a big fan of history stuff. I love listening to to podcasts like You Must Remember This, for instance. And it, it's oh, quite yeah. fascinating to hear, yeah, what the 1920s were were like for for movie stars. Even uh, the the life they had uh, was was quite terrible <laughs> compared to all uh, contemporary standards. Uh, so yeah, what, what about uh, capers? What was it? Uh, what what was the the goal ultimately when you started it? Uh, well, I, since it is a game with superpowers in it, it's certainly ob obviously an alternate history. Like it's not it's not wholly like our own um, history. And the the characters that are presented in there, there's a lot of characters who are drawn right from history. Like uh, Lucky Luciano and um, Al Capone and characters like these are in the game. Um, and some of them are super powered and some of them are not. Um, but then I also like. I didn't want, I wanted the game to be kind of like a fun shoot 'em up gangster game and not be necessarily um, uh, bogged down with like, you know, it was the twenties and racism was rampant. Not that it isn't now, right? But racism was rampant and women who, women had just gotten the right to vote in the United States. And there was uh, like homophobia was like off the charts. Um, and there's a lot of, of you know, historically uh, there's, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of problems tied up in a lot of all of that. Um, and there are certainly games that can address those issues. I'm not the right person to write those games. Um, so this game presupposes the idea that um, basically, if you want to examine those themes, you can, but I didn't bake it into the game. I didn't force you to down that road with the game. Um, the game is intended to be much more inclusive. So there are characters that are gender flipped. There are characters that you know, I created a lot of different uh, of non-white, you know, like pro prohibition character. Like a lot of the personalities that you know from prohibition are white guys um, of Italian or Irish descent, occasionally Jewish, um, in their 30s and 40s. That's what most of these guys are that that you know, the ones that everybody knows. So I broadened that out, and I created all sorts of other NPCs and um, characters uh, that are representing. Um, uh, a much wider spectrum of people because I want I want anybody to be able to look at the game and flip through it and see the artwork and see that it's you know it's it's a much more varied culture and world that's presented in the game. The uh, you know the you're going to be playing a super powered character which sets you apart. I I didn't build in a lot of um, well you're also a woman and that means certain things or you're also Hispanic and that means certain things. Um, not that you can't explore those themes. I just didn't make it integral. Um, to the game as presented. So is the game sort of standalone and you're done with it and you're moving on your next project or are you expanding it with supplements or campaigns, more adventures and things like that? Um, I did uh, I did three supplements for the game um, 
and that the third one is coming out very shortly. I'm just waiting on a proof copy to make sure that it looks good. Um, and then that's done. That's that's going to be the run of, of this campaign, um, of this uh, game line. And what I did for the, each of the supplements was um, this, the first supplement is called Capers Noir, and it takes the storyline from the 20s up to the 40s and transforms the game into uh, like a crime noir game. So it's um, there, it includes rules for uh, mysteries and um, in, there's 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 new stuff for players as to new powers, new you know, character options and so forth. And then there's like a new city that's presented in this case, Los Angeles, to set your kind of noir stories in um, and a bunch of tools and things that go with that. So the so the idea is that the supplement like it's got stuff that you can use in your capers game, but it also be, allows you to play like this other version of um, super powered criminals. Um, and cops um, basically like you'll come to see that each of the capers books is like it's basically cops and robbers with superpowers just different versions of cops and robbers um, and then the second supplement is uh, capers covert which takes you to the 60s and everything becomes a uh, kind of james bond era super spy versus super villain with superpowers nice um, so it's got rules for gadgets and vehicle chases um, and then uh, Las Vegas is presented as um, a city backdrop with all the casinos and everything. Um, uh, London gets a write-up in there. <laughs> um, Swinging sixties, you had to. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and again, like the the game has you know stuff for players and players and GMs in general that you can use in the other um, games, but you can also play this super spy version. Um, and then the last one that's coming out is called Capers Off World, which is takes it back to the 20s but it's an alternate alternate of the 20s where all the all the cops and robbers with superpowers happens but we've also discovered space flight <laughs> and it's buck rogers slash flash gordon sort of retro future um science fiction so it's that kind of cheesy 20s and 30s pulp era um kind of sci-fi look and feel to it um so then of course that's got alien world so you can play alien species um, and it's like space cops and space robbers and um, cops and robbers and in space <laughs> in space with alcohol and other illegal substances from other planets um, <laughs> and then that <laughs> and then that that book also has a section in it that also then kind of touches on time travel so you can potentially use that to tie all of the settings together oh so you wow could have characters that jump between eras you could you, you could potentially have characters that are the children of other characters who, you know, inherit their, their parents' powers or new powers. And, you know, you could, there's a lot of interesting things you could do with kind of jumping around between all the settings because Offworld gives you the guidelines for, for connecting everything. So did you manage to pull that off at your own table? Do you, do you run the game enough so you, you manage to tie everything together like that? <laughs> I've run some cam I've run some short campaigns, um, but I haven't run a really long term one, and 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 I've not run a campaign a, a full campaign like that since I've been working on the supplements. Usually, I end up running one shots um, with the supplements because I'm play testing. Um, I'm play, you know, play testing specific elements. Um, I've got an idea in mind for something that I could do, like if I could get it set up on a stream or something like that. Maybe I'll do it as just 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 a campaign with friends. But I think it could be interesting for a stream as well, which would actually tie everything together. We'd start the characters in one place and we'd take them to different places. I have I don't want to give anything away, but I've got some interesting ideas about how you might be able to, to jump around. And that would that would t take it, you know, very clearly into the realm of science fiction. Like, okay, now it's a time travel story. Um, but that's okay. You know, time travel, you know, super you know, like your your comic books and, and comic book movies and everything, there's always there's plenty of time travel and jumping between different worlds and different times yeah and resurrections of all kind uh, oh, you, yeah. whatever you want can happen uh, you mentioned you were working on a on a project at the moment so are you working on one of those supplements or is it yet another game uh, has it been announced yet if it if it's a new one um i've been yeah i've been talking about it a little bit i've been working on it for about i don't um, a year maybe um well the the initial concept is older than that but like really working on it for about a year um and uh it's a, a game called tentatively titled good strong hands and it's a it's a game of um fantastical creatures and their human allies 
who are working to save their world from destruction at the hands of this faceless, malevolent entity called the Void. Um, and it draws inspiration from things like The NeverEnding Story, Labyrinth, Willow, Legend, um, uh, Dark Crystal, uh, stuff like the, the, those kind of nostalgic, fan, light, mostly light, light-hearted fantasy um, stories from. It, does uh, the title movies. come from the Never Ending Story? Because now that you said that, I I remember the rock yeah. writer says something about about his hands and uh, oh, yeah, uh, powerless <laughs> he was to save the day. Huh? Yeah, rock writer at one point um, he saw the the in, in the Never Ending Story. It's called the Nothing. And he saw the nothing coming and he tried to stop it, but he couldn't. And he laments as he's very sad and he laments um, to Atreyu that um, they look like good, strong hands, don't they? Like he tried um, and failed. So the, the hope is that uh, the characters in this story will, uh, will succeed with their good, strong hands. Um, so it, it has uh, you know, hints of um, your, you know, you, it, the, you can't save the world alone. It's it's about working together, about finding um, uh, friendships and being there with each other, and doing this together as a group. Um, and and everybody, you know, like everybody in the if you if you're playing the game, you're playing a different pl different playbooks, and each playbook is like a different fantastic race, um, or what I'm referring to in the game as folk. Um, um, and then there's also humans, and humans don't come from the world; they come from Earth. They travel there, like in some of these movies. Um, and so, um, you know, you play one of these one of these characters. Um, you have it's a fairly simple game. You've got four traits that covers pretty much everything you do, and then everybody has some talents that allow them to kind of break the rules and do some interesting things. Um, but if you succeed too well, if you do too well, the void notices you, and it attempts to corrupt you and tempt you down the path to become one of its minions. Um, and so, it also becomes a uh, uh, you know, it's a, characters have to make the choice. Players have to make the choice about whether or not their character is going. They're freely going to let their character be tempted down that road and gain power that could potentially be used to help stop the void, but endanger themselves and their friends in the process. Or are they going to re simply resist it and keep themselves true and whole? Um, and so uh, the game is intended. It doesn't have a lot of setting information. Um, I don't define the entire world. I define pieces of it to use for adventures, um, but it's intended to be very much a, um, a, co a collaborative storytelling game. Like each of the folk, there's a, like a, a couple of lines that describes what these folk are like on the sheet, on the character sheet. And then there's no history of the folk. There's no information about their society or what they, you know, not exa exactly what they look like and how they act with each other, what their families are like, what their government or religion or anything like that is like. The idea would be that if you're playing, for example, a woodkin, um, uh, you would, as as you played the game, you would define what that society is like and whether they have um, a government and what kind of government it is and what their homes are like. Do they live in giant cities? Do they live in little towns? Are they nomadic? You know what all that you you you'll define that as part of the story. Yeah, it's more a concept, and then you you put the skin you you want or you're inspired by, but by, by uh, on top of it. Then, right. The idea is that every time you play the game, you're b you're given a, a toolbox of things that are kind of common, but then you'll create a whole new world every time, and then save that. World. Cool. So we actually had an episode of uh, one of our spin-off show, the the RPG Academy Film Studies, about the never-ending story. And uh, one of the things we discussed as part of this episode was uh, role-playing with children. Uh, is that something you had in mind when you developed that project? Or is it yeah, you adults playing children, but not necessarily a game for children to play? Um, it is addressed in the book. Uh, there is that dark side of like gaining corruption and becoming dark, you know, becoming dark as a character. Um, but I, during playtesting, I had multiple people say, well, like, this, this would be, uh, a, you know, it's a simple enough game that you could play this with with a lot of kids. And so there is a section in the, in the book that describes like, how would you do this if you wanted to play it with kids? So like, if you want to play it with kids and you don't want to focus on having that corruption stuff in there, just remove it, just dump that part entirely. And then they, like, here's a couple of minor rules tweaks um, about like what you do instead of like when the void notices you, like when you get good successes and everything, instead of the potential of, of uh, gaining corruption, there's something else that's more fun for kids. 
um, and they, so you don't have to play that that side of it up. Um, so I think the game, uh, you know, is simple enough um, with kind of interesting enough characters and kind of fantastic looking um, little beings that you can play that it would be appealing um, to to children and, and families, you know, parents and, and kids to play together um, or a group of siblings to play. Um, and then they can they can uh, kind of tweak the rules a little bit to get rid of uh, any of the stuff that won't, they won't have fun with. So you you've been running playtests for this one uh, already as well. Yeah, I've been I've run a handful of playtests myself, and then I've got the uh, the rules have been in um, playtest uh, like beta level playtests with other groups, where I give the whole manuscript to a group and say, okay, read this. <laughs> Hopefully, you can follow it and run the game. Um, and I, I'm in you know I've I've gone through multiple rounds of playtesting like that. It's actually in a round of playtesting right now. Manuscript other than the adventure kind of outlines that are part of the story. I've written a handful of those for them people to use for the playtest, but the bulk of the manuscript, the rules, the, um, the information about the game, the world, um, and the characters is, is all written. So I don't think, you know, as, assuming I don't run into any big bumps with playtesting, the Kickstarter is probably not far away. I think I could probably start to pull this together. And I've got an artist and a graphic designer that are working on stuff. Great. I'm actually with my own game. I'm about to move into. I guess it's called beta. Uh, I need to to finish the rules and bring them to a level so I can share that manuscript with other people to to run it. Uh, are there big lessons you've learned going through to that process yourself uh, for a young game designer like me? Not so young. <laughs> young in game design, not um, young in age. <laughs> um, well, uh, you know, everybody's. Everybody's process is going to be a little different on that, and it's going to be, um, you know, it depends on the game, and it depends on, like, the play style and the groups that you've got going. But um, one of the things that I have found most useful is um, um, certainly providing us... Don't don't ask for them to just give you your their feedback. You know, just, like, don't leave it open-ended like that, because they, they may not give you the, um, enough information. They may not give you information about the things you really want, feedback on so provide a questionnaire provide you know like a survey for them to fill out um and i tend to have my surveys like in the first time the, everything goes out all the questions in the survey are very general like you know do the rules read well are they intuitive is everything clear um how do, you know like if there's a, a, if there's a major subset of rules like combat or social interaction or something like does this does this make sense if there's um, currencies within the game, like if you spend certain character points, um, you know, some sort of thing. Like, that, are those, you know, were those easy to keep track of? Did you feel you got something worthwhile by spending the points in game? So, you know, very general kind of you know discussions. Um, and then as you go to the next round and the next round, you can start asking more specific questions about like, okay, how did how does the initiative system work? How does um, how do the rules for this monster work? Um, you know, do spells make sense? Like you start to hone in and kind of get narrower and narrower. Um, and then I also like asking, um, there's a few questions that I try to ask that like I had a friend who design game, designs games and he said one of the things he always liked to ask at the table was there, was there anything that got in the way of the fun? Um, and uh, I always get really interesting answers with that. They're, you know, they're often very different answers from very di from every group. Um, and, you know, you know, you have to kind of pick and, you know, kind of figure out which ones are, uh, like, if, if something got in the way of the fun for the group, is that, like, just a group preference? Or is it a serious problem with the game? Um, like, if you say, like, you know, what got in the way of the fun? And somebody says, combat takes forever. Well, if that's not what you're going for, if you want a game that resolves rule stuff quickly, you know, that's a problem. Um, so... Um, you're not asking them to solve the problem for you. That's your job as the designer, but you're asking like the general question of like, what's the one thing that makes you go, oh, not, not right, not good, not, not as good as it could be. Do you, That's a good question to ask. Do you hand that survey alongside the manuscript or do you wait for them to play and then you share the questions with them? Um, I give that survey to the GM with the manuscript, the players, um, I don't know if the GMs uh, share their questions with the players or not, but I, I'll, I always ask the GM to, um, to read the questions, the survey, before they run. 
I want them to know what they're looking for. Um, and, you know, early on, like I said, it's usually very general stuff, so it's not that big of a deal. But like when you get a few, a few uh, play tests in, you might be asking specific questions. Okay, now, like make a character and break the rules. Like find, find the broken combos, find the things that make the game um, unfun or you know, like that will make other players think, well, my character doesn't do that, <laughs> um, you know, to, to get them to, to, to really put it through its paces. And I, like I did that with capers. There was, there was a superpower at one point that was described too vaguely. And I had players that like by the rules as written discovered that you could instantly kill people with it <laughs> by, because I asked them, look at the powers and try to break one. Like, They've they played the game enough times to know that there's no such thing as instant kill in the game. Like you always have, there's always a little. If there's going to be a fight, there's it's going to take a little while. Um, and they discovered um, uh, a, a power where it's like, well, if you do this, they, like the character's dead. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, oh yeah, that's a problem. <laughs> I don't want that happening. Do you still have time to to play other people's game with uh, with all that work? I try to. Um, The biggest problem I have is finding people because uh, I'm trying to play other, uh, you know, a, a variety of games. So, like, I've played plenty of D&D. I don't need to play D&D anymore. Will I play D&D sometime? Sure. But I'm trying to find other things. Um, I've been playing a short campaign of masks. Um, we're having our last session coming up on Sunday. That'll be the wrap up to that. That's been a lot of fun. Um, and I had I had played a little bit of Masks once a couple of years ago, and I, I'm only passingly familiar with uh, the Powered by the Apocalypse games. I hadn't played them too much, but this is the first time I've had to, uh, that I've played more than a one shot where it's been a short a short campaign. So, so Masters in I, I do get a chance occasionally. So Masters is interesting because it's got a, a bit of overlap with Caper. So uh, when you were playing it, were you like, oh, I never thought of that? Or uh, were, there, were there things overlap which annoyed you or intrigued you with the, between the two? Well, there's usually, like, any well-written game, and Masks is, is very well put together. Um there's usually something in there that like, Oh, could I have, you know, taken that and tweaked that and put that into my game? Like, you know, um, because so much of game design is, is, uh, uh borrowing and, and twisting and turning and tweaking. Um, you know, the, when somebody invents something wholly new, that's a rare thing. Usually it's like every, every, most people are working on variations of a theme. And so, yeah, there's things in there that, um, I mean, I think there are things about masks that have to do with um, not that it would necessarily be right for capers, but for me, like, for example, in masks, the labels, the five traits that your characters has, they're referred to as labels. And because you're playing kid characters, you're like your your view of yourself is always changing and you're always kind of trying on new identities and trying to figure out who you're going to be. So you like literally change your labels and your numbers go up and down. Like one day you might be um, like a, a better savior, a better, you know, better at saving people and helping people. And one day you might be better at just being a regular kid. Um, and so like, that's a, that's a really brilliantly put together mechanic. Um, so like, will I, will I borrow that <laughs> at some point for some game when it's appropriate, that basic idea? Um, if I find the, the right place for it, yeah, it's, uh, it's good design. What I thought was fascinating with masks is I, I often, for a long time, I thought that superheroes were very difficult to do in uh, in role playing games, and I, I thought what was smart with masks is that they 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 did the guardian nut thing. <laughs> they they did not break found the equation for having uh, power points to balance a speedster versus. A, uh, a Nova or Spider-Man or something like that. They just said, "Well, actually, none of that really matters. You can still do the fight, but what matters is how people feel about what is going on and the, the drama going on between the players." And I thought it was very interesting to take a topic and actually sideline it, but at the same time still stick to the the original material because that's true that when you read the comics, uh, there's no there's no balance between the X-Men. They got different sets of powers and they do different stuff with them but it, it doesn't really matter the, their powers are mainly what the what the plot requires to be yeah the stories are about their emotions and their relationships with each other um and you know and some allegory 
<laughs> yeah, uh, um, about uh, civil rights and so forth. But um, yeah, that's uh, powered, the Powered by the Apocalypse games do that really well. Like in, like you said in Masks, it's like I'm playing this. I'm playing a, a Janus character, so like a Spider-Man character. He has he's like he's like a regular kid, but then he put, puts on the the outfit and he becomes a superhero. And like I'm looking at like I was asking my the, G, uh, the, the GM about like you know using a power, and and she said I don't care. <laughs> like does my power do this sure why not because that's not the point of the game <laughs> i can i can go ahead and as long as i'm not trying to like instant win any uh, um conflict that you come up because you, you know you do need to have a conflict and have it actually be meaningful and have a you know and win a fight um or lose it um she was more concerned i was like you know it took me a while to to grasp the idea like oh the superpowers really are just like their flavor they're 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 a coat of paint on top of uh your character um relating to each other and figuring themselves out uh, i'm very uh, lately I, i've started playing with the the gauntlet community and uh, there's someone running and developing a game there i would really like to try uh, it's called power beyond doubt and it's trying to it's trying to take to do the masks thing uh, or the caper thing, but with the focus on playing older superheroes, so it's more oh. midlife crisis or elderly uh, superheroes uh, kind of crisis, and it's more about how you you engage with the, your public persona uh, or people take you. So apparently, you only have two labels, which I believe are your amount of power, of actual power, and how the 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 public perceive you and. Uh, and actually, the the stronger you are, the the best you are seen from the public. The the biggest the chances of having a a big scandal, a big drama with the public uh, are, and it's it looks quite interesting. Uh, th yeah, there's a lot of good game uh, to to try out there. Um, are there comics or movies which? Especially inspired you for capers and uh, and uh, your your games beyond the never ending story. <laughs> um, well, capers was ca the idea of doing capers came from watch it when I was I was trying to figure out what I was going to do for a game and it was I was thinking a supers game I just wasn't sure what type of supers game I knew I didn't want to do just kind of a traditional thing because there's you know there's fifty games that do that. Um, so I wanted something a little a little more out of the ordinary. And I was watching Boardwalk Empire and I started to get intrigued by the idea of, of super powered characters in that era. Um, uh, I'm, uh, I'm, a, I'm a big horror movie um, fan. I've been a fan of horror movies since I was fairly young, um, watching them when, you know, my parents didn't know that I was watching them. The best time um, to watch them. Oh yeah, absolutely. 13 and 14 year old, that's the best, the best time for horror movies. If you can get your hands on actual rated R horror movies, um, and uh, so, and and uh, uh, I have there's a, I have a soft spot in my heart, particularly for horror comedies. Um, so uh, I I made a game like that. I I created a game called Die Laughing that is like literally just like my love letter to horror movies in general and horror comedies specifically so it's the, the game is all about you're playing a character you're literally playing a character in a horror story in a horror movie um and you're going to die so make it funny um and by the end of the game most or all of the characters um get killed but when your character is gone you become a producer on the movie oh and so cool. you continue to you continue to to be part of the story and manipulate what's going on with the movie um and uh yeah, it was that, that was a challenge for myself to figure out like what to do with a horror story with a horror RPG where you know, what do you do when your character dies? Well, usually the response is well you just make a new character, and that kind of removes the sting um, of the death because it's like well now I just play somebody else. Um, so I made like you know I, I specifically did this like as a as a as an attempt to like okay we're gonna we're gonna kill everybody off and there and nobody's coming back and we're not gonna let you play another character but you still have something to do. It really feels uh, the the concept really sounds like uh, um, Evil Dead from the get go uh, with uh, so many characters who die or cabins in the wood uh, <laughs> with characters who die but uh, they, they, st they got still have stuff uh, going on there the the craziness 
builds on. So you can imagine there's more producers involved. Uh, actually, there, there was today uh, a friend of mine was asking uh, for for horror movies, which were not quite horror, but more spooky, because she, she's not that much into the, the gore and this sort of thing. And uh, it made me realize that we had covered two of them. Uh, I'm going to do some more shameless plug for the RPG Academy Film Study. So if you have not watched them yet, I recommend uh, Delicatessen, which I think is somewhat known in the US. It's a French movie. It's post-apocalyptic, but it's very contained, and it, it revolves around a a butcher who uh, murders people so he can uh, feed uh, the people living in the building. But it, it's very... It's the same people who did... Um, uh, what was it called? Um, the the City of Lost Children. Actually, they did okay. that movie to finance uh, The City of Lost Children. And another one which I really, really recommend if you are into horror comedy uh, that we covered is El Dia de la Bestia which is made by a Spanish director called Alex de la Iglesia and it's it's a true cult movie in Spain and to a lesser extent uh, it's it's quite less known in France and Belgium but you you follow a, a priest uh, so it's going to be Christmas and the priest worked out the date of the birth of the antichrist but he needs to work out <laughs> When the ant- where the Antichrist will be born, and to do so, his plan is to do evil stuff. So he becomes a follower of Satan, and then Satan will tell him, and then he, he can be a turncoat a- and kill the Antichrist. <laughs> but but it's really it's really in the mood of you never quite know if if he's right and if the people he embarks on uh, are sort of right or if they are just having a uh, a shared hallucination because they, they took drugs and so on but it's uh, it's, a, it's a very good movie I find I really recommend it to, to the US audience um, yeah, I just looked it up uh, I'm going to I'm gonna have to check that out That's oh really yeah intriguing. Well, you, c- you can it's check all where, where I can see it you can check all episodes about them uh, especially the uh, I'm quite proud of those two uh, uh, I put a, a lot of time editing them. Uh, I, I, there's a little summary of the episode, so there are spoilers in there. But uh, yeah, I put a, a lot of work. Um, uh, do you have anything else you wish to discuss uh, before we we part ways until uh, Nerd Burger Con? <laughs> um, uh, we we covered quite a lot of what's going on with uh, with everything. Um, um, I will I will say this. Um, and and you know you're working on a game, and I know that there are a lot of people out there that uh, who play games who have have ideas that they like. You know, oh, I wish you know, I wish there was a game that did this, or I wish you know, I wish this other game had this element to it. Um, and um, I'm a firm believer that there's no such thing as too many games. That if you if you can think of an idea, there's an audience out there for it. It's just a question of finding them, um, and you can do that. And we are living in an age when it's easier than ever to make your game, to publish it in some format, if that's just PDF or actually make a book or whatever, um, and to find that audience. So, you know, anybody who's listening to this, anybody who plays games, tell your friends to, um, like, take a shot. Try to make that game. Like, if you've got if you've got an idea that you think is really cool, there are probably people out there right now who are just waiting for that game. Like they don't know that they want that game, or maybe they do. They just know it doesn't exist yet. Um, make that game for them and for yourself. Give it a shot. That's a great finisher. So, where can people uh, find you? And uh, and uh, yeah, what's your goodbye? Uh, you can find me on Twitter. I'm at nerdburgercraig. Um, uh, nerdburgergames.com is the website. Uh, there's uh, there's a convention um nerdburger con link uh and page on the website right now which um and in there there's a whole list of like the people who are going to be there and some basic information about the convention as well as a link to sign up um the way this is working is anybody who signs up for the convention early gets um uh an email with information about where to go to sign up for events one day before the public so um, if you know you can commit to uh, being involved, even if it's just to want to play one game or um, on, on one day, um, sign up so that we know you're coming. That helps me to plan, and you'll get to, uh, to sign up for events early. Um, 
And uh, for the record, we didn't mention it. This is all free. This is not going to cost you a single um, uh, coin or bill. Um, there will be some fundraising things that happen as part of it, um, but that is your choice, of course. But the, the, the convention itself, everything's free. And uh, uh, and you can go to drivethroughrpg.com uh, to, uh, to buy all my stuff, too. You can find all the Nerdburger game stuff there. I will uh, include. Uh, I will look up a, a series of, of links for Nerd Burger Con and your games, and include them in the the description of this episode, both on YouTube and uh, on my podcast feed. So people are, please head to the description uh, and go click there. Uh, hopefully, I will be at Nerd Burger Con. I will go to to subscribe uh, right away. Maybe I will be running some Paris Gondo. Uh, I definitely hope so. And uh, if not, and uh, well, in addition to that, I will also be at the Gauntlet community open gaming days which are just the next weekend so you can have two weekends in a row uh, of online fun uh, thank you very much Greg uh, Craig for joining me and uh, yeah I look forward to uh, to taking part uh, to your con uh, both uh, as a player and maybe a runner of game excellent thank and thank you for reaching out to me well, this was fun cheers bye bye <laughs>